So what if that's the reason we're lucky is that we got to have a rare cascading of um, like an accelerating cascading effect in terms of the complexity of things. So like m maybe most of the universe is trying to get sticky with the memory mm -hmm. and it's not able to really form it. And then we got really lucky in that. And it has nothing, It like there's a lot of Earth-like conditions, let's say, but it's just, you really, really have to get lucky on this. But like, I'm, doing experiment. I'm doing experiments right now. In fact, experiments that Sarah and I are working on because we have some joint funding for this where we're seeing that the universe can get sticky really quickly. Now, of course, we're being very anthropocentric, we're using laboratory tools, we're using theory, but actually the phenomena of selection, the process of heterogen developing heterogeneity, we can do in the lab. We're just seeing the very first hints of it. And it, wouldn't it be great if um, we can start to pin down a bit more precisely um, begin, begin, becoming good Bayesianists for this, for the origin of life and the emergence of life, to finding out what kind of chemistries we really need to look for. Um, and I'm becoming increasingly confident we'll be able to do that in the next few years. Make life in the lab or make some selection in the lab from inorganic stuff, from sand, from rocks, from dead stuff, from moon. Wouldn't it be great to get stuff from the moon, put it in our, our origin of life experiment and make moon life? <laughs> and restrict ourselves to interesting self-replicating stuff that we find on the moon. Uh, Sarah, what do you think about this approach of engineering life in order to understand life? So building life in the, in the machine. Yeah, so I mean, Lee, Lee and I are trying right now to uh, build a vision for a large institute or experimental program basically to do this problem. But I think of it as like, we need to simulate a planet. So like the Large Hadron Collider was supposed to be simulating conditions just after the Big Bang. Lee's built a lot of technology in his lab to do these kind of selection engines. But the question you're asking is, how many experiments do you need to run? What volume of chemical space do you need to explore before you actually see an event? And I like to make an analogy to one of my favorite particle physics experiments, which is Super Kamiokande that's looking for the decay of the proton. So this is something that we predicted theoretically, but we've never observed in our universe. And basically what they're doing is every time they don't see a proton decay event, they have a longer bound on the lifetime of a proton. So imagine we built an experiment with the idea in mind of trying to simulate planetary conditions, physically simulate. You can't simulate origin life in a computer. You have to do it in an experiment. Simulate enough planetary conditions to explore the space of what's possible and bound the probability for an original life event. Even if you're not observing it, you can talk about the probability. But we, hopefully, life is not exponentially rare and we would then be able to evolve in an automated system alien life in the lab. And if we can do that, then we understand the physics as well as we understand what we can do in particle accelerators. So keep expanding physically the simulation, the physical simulation, until something happens. Yeah, or just build, build a big enough volume of chemical experiments and, and so evolve like, them. When you say volume, you mean like literally volume? I mean uh, physical volume in terms of space, but I actually mean volume in terms of the combinatorial space of chemistry. So, so like, how do you nicely control the combinatorial exploration, the search space, no, I, such, such that it's always like, you keep grabbing the low hanging fruit. Yeah. How do you build a search engine for chemistry? To I think you explained it really well. We should carry on doing this. I should pretend the physics, be the physicist, you be the chemist. No. So <laughs> the way to do it is, um, I will always play a joke because I've, I, 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 I like writing grants, um, uh, to ask for you know money to do cool stuff. But the, and I years ago I started wanting to build. So I actually wanted the where the. So I built this robot in my lab called the Computer, which is this robot you can program to do chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, now it's a pro. I made a programming language for the computer and made it operate chemi chemi chemical equipment. Um, originally, I wrote grants to say, "Hey, I want to make an origin of life system," and no one would give me any money for this. They said, "What this is ridiculous? Why are you wanting to make? Oh, it's really hard. It takes forever. You're not a very good origin of life chemist anyway. Why would we give you any money?" And so I turned it around and said, can you can instead, can you give me money to make robots, to make molecules that are interesting? And everyone went, yeah, okay, you can do that. Uh, um, and that's, so actually the funny thing is the computer, 
um, project, which I have in my lab, which is a, very briefly, it's just basically, it's like literally an automated test tube. And we've made a programming language for the test tube, which is cool. Um, um, has come, has literally came from this. I went to my lab one day, I said, I want to make a search engine to get the origin of life because I don't have a planet. And I thought about doing it in a microfluidic format. So microfluidic is very nano, cha cha very small channels in device where you can basically have all the pipes lit dump, produced by lithography. And you can have a chamber, maybe say between say 10 and 100 microns in volume. And we slot them all together like Lego and we can make an origin of life system. And I, I could never get it to work. Um, and I realized I had to make do chemistry at the kind of test tube level. And what you want to be able to do, yeah, yeah, it goes back to 90, that, that tweet, 1981. In 1981, the computer, we're looking at a tweet from Lee. In 1981, the computer was a distant dream. In Oh, wow, this is the scientist looking back at his, <laughs> the, the young boy who dreamed. In 2018, it was realized, spelled in a British way, realized. Um, yeah, I'm which is the wrong said, way. But, but not. But. So now there's a system that does the physical manifestation or whatever the programming language, um, the spec uh, tells you to do. Yeah, well, in 1981, I got my first computer, ZX81. Uh, well, what was the computer? ZX81. ZX81. Sinclair ZX81. It was, um, and I got a chemistry set. <laughs> and I like, I like the chemistry set. And I like the computer, and I just wanted to put them together. I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could use use the computer to control the chemistry set? And um, and obviously that was insane. And I was like, you know, <laughs> you know, eight years old, right? Nine years old, going on nine years old. And um, and then I I I invented the computer just because I wanted to build this origin of life grid, right? Which is like literally a billion test tubes connected together in real time and real space basically throwing a chemical die dice throw dice throw dice throw dice you're going to get lucky um and that's what we i think sarah and i have been thinking very deeply about because um you know there's more money being spent on the 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 origin of the gravity or looking at the higgs boson than the origin of life right and the origin of life is the I think the biggest question, or not the biggest question, it is a big question. Let's put it, it that way. It is the biggest question.